welcome back. We have Randy Fry in with us again today with legislation. How are you doing, Randy? Hi, Debbie. How are you? I'm doing great. Yeah. So you had a little vacation because of COVID. Yeah. Well, no kidding. Uh, the state house has been shut down for quite a while. Yeah. And, uh, everybody's been trying to stay healthy, and uh, hopefully uh, you are as well. Uh, but uh, trying to get our state back uh, up right. and running, you know, and that yes. starts Monday. Yeah, that's why our chairs are so far apart compared to <laughs> what we normally do. <laughs> it just, but it, it works. As long as we sure. stay a good distance, it helps mm -hmm. out. Sure. So with this summer thing, you've got all kinds of things going on during the summer months, not just in the mm -hmm. winter months, that's but you've got new bills that uh -huh. are coming out. What right. are some of those? Well, uh, Debbie, uh, today uh, is the first day of July. Yes. And, uh, and uh, that's the first day that new bills go into effect in Indiana. Now, it is possible for a bill to go into effect earlier, but those are uh, considered emergency provisions. Most bills go into effect uh, after the governor signs them on July the 1st, which is, today is the first day of the state's new year. Right. It runs July 1 to June 30. And so uh, we do have our new bills going into effect this, uh, today. Uh, one of them, I'm sure your listeners are aware of, is a bill that uh, deals with cell phones and not being able to hold that phone in your hand anymore. Um, what it does, Debbie, and, and I'm on the Roads and Transportation Committee, that bill came through our committee, and I'll be honest with you, in the beginning, I wasn't too sure I was going to support it. I don't much uh, like those kind of restrictions. Uh, I also know that there are things like um, a Big Mac that can distract you, hot coffee, a drop cigarette, uh, a lot of different things that you know, loud music, a friend. So where does it end? Uh, but in the testimony, uh, we heard from law enforcement, we heard from citizens, that the number one cause of these accidents of distracted drivers was the cell phone. Mm. Um, we had testimony from uh, folks who ride motorcycles. A uh, man and his wife are on two different bikes, pulled off the side of the road to, uh, to do something, and a distracted driver hit him, and they each lost a leg. Um, we heard from a mom, a young woman that uh, uh, her daughter is Jacksondale, I believe, senior, uh, this is a few years back, and her daughter was texting while she was driving, and she uh, uh, had an accident and killed her. And, uh, and that was just the beginning. What law enforcement testified over and over in favor of the bill. As a matter of fact, I don't remember anybody testified against the bill. Um, but to, to make it clear, if you were to get in your car right now and drive from here in Madison to Florida, as soon as you crossed the Ohio River, you'd have already been in a state where you couldn't hold your cell phone in your hand. You know, Kentucky, Tennessee, Georgia, and Florida already enacted it. So we were not on the cutting edge with this. We, we, we uh, are now a uh, part of it, but the other states had already adopted it. But, um, you know, when you weigh the, the, the restrictions on someone's freedom versus uh, protecting the people, you have to err on the side of protecting the people. And uh, that's what we did, and the uh, bill passed overwhelmingly, and uh, the governor, of course, signed it into law, and it took effect today. And it's not really that bad. I mean, if you have a device that you put in mm -hmm. your, the little vents for right, your air conditioner or, you mm -hmm. or your cup holder, yeah. you can always just touch the button and do a voice. You, you know. can. You can use your speaker. Yes. Um, I don't have Bluetooth in my uh, car I drove today, so I use a speaker. It's not great, but it's okay. I could get a pair, set of earbuds and make it even better. But, uh, or you can use, as we said, Bluetooth technology. Um, uh, you, Debbie, you can pick up that phone and use it if you're calling 911. Oh, yes. That's, that's, a, that's, that's an exemption in the, the bill. Yes. So if you needed to call 911, you can pick the phone up and do that. Um, but, uh, again, it's, uh, it is a little inconvenient sometimes, but in the, in the end, uh, it's for safety. Right. You can continue to use your phone, all the different apps that are all different things your phone can do. Yes, can, road map. Yeah, you but, just can't hold it in your hand. Right. But if it's up there where you can see it, you can right. see the road map and you, you do mm -hmm. just fine. It's that looking down that is mm -hmm. what's caused so much stuff to happen. Uh, it's all, also, they told us that when it's held up here, you're pretty much blind your from vision. here over. Yeah. Or if you're left-handed from here over. And so, um, you know, that, that also causes quite a problem with accidents. It, it really does. Mm -hmm. And then, now that brings us to another one about mm -hmm. uh, the smoking bill. Right. And there's, there's several reasons why. Mm -hmm. That bill was brought into effect. Right. And, and Debbie, to be clear, uh, that bill was actually the changing of the age from smoking, legal smoking from 18 to 21, was done at the federal level. 
uh, federal government did it this year, and uh, the reason that Indiana matched the federal law uh, was because in a lot of cases we do that with matching the federal law, but our penalties had to be the same as the federal law. So instead of someone selling to someone under age 18, it had to be changed to someone selling to someone under age 21. Uh, and you know, we heard a lot of testimony on that bill as well, and I heard from constituents, some of them felt like it was an overreach and uh, that you shouldn't go there. Uh, but I can tell you that the big factor in why we changed it, um, I like to uh, travel about and, um, and visit my schools. Uh, I like to have lunch with my seniors and I like to just talk to them and the administrators. And I always ask them, what's your biggest challenge in a school? What's the biggest problem? And every time, every school says vaping. They, Vaping's they the biggest problem. And they tell me it goes all the way down into elementary school. And so I said, well, what's the solution? I said, raise the age to be able to buy it. I said, but a, a kindergarten, or not a kindergarten, but elementary school, school ch child or middle school child, they can't buy it. I said, but their older siblings are buying it that live in the home, and then they're giving it to them. So uh, that was a situation where uh, when we raise the age, um, we're gonna, hopefully we can keep it out of the hands of these young people whose brains are still developing and they're addicted to nicotine. It's, it's terrible. Um, so hopefully that'll work. Uh, I've heard folks, and you have too, most likely, that said, well, if you can serve your country uh, at age 18, you ought to be able to smoke at age 18. And um, I can tell you that the, uh, the military testified in our committee that they didn't want any of their soldiers smoking. And so I think it's probably, uh, that was again one of those factors that helped me uh, support the legislation. Well, that, I can't imagine somebody in the military running 10 miles and smoking. Oh, yeah. It's make it awfully difficult for them yeah, to accomplish what they're supposed to be yeah, doing. Yeah, it would be. Uh, so as a, as a grandfather, I cannot imagine one of my grandchildren telling me that they started smoking today and me being happy about it. No. Um, so I, I certainly uh, wouldn't I be wanna, happy. I want to protect them, and, uh, and, uh, the, but the vaping was a huge issue here. It has to be, yeah. So that's, that'll be a good thing for the high schools and the Let's hope schools. it works. It will definitely have an effect. We'll find out. Now, you'll never eliminate everything, I don't right. think, but it will have a huge mm -hmm. impact on their ability mm -hmm. to access vaping. We'll, we'll find out. I think we will. We'll get feedback. Oh, yeah. You'll definitely get it within, within six months after school mm -hmm. starts. <laughs> <laughs> so, But now there's, there's another thing that's really cool. Mm -hmm. The farmers now have another avenue right. to access health insurance. Now, they how do, do they do that? Well, Indiana Farm Bureau... Um, and by the way, Indiana Farm Bureau is an excellent organization that comes to the State House all the time and, and uh, lets us know what their opinion is on legislation and where they want it or they don't. And uh, they brought us a bill this year that uh, allows Indiana Farm Bureau to sell uh, life insu or, uh, health insurance to farmers or members of the uh, Indiana Farm Bureau. Now, uh, they're not uh, an insurance agent so much as they are a ability to sell the product. Someone else is the, the insurance company. But um, we know that it was successful, it had been used in Tennessee, and uh, they, they had done very well. And it gives those farmers the opportunity uh, to have another option besides going to the marketplace to get their health care. And a lot of times we heard that uh, the health care just wasn't there or what didn't, didn't work for them or it was too expensive. And so here's another option, and uh, it was a, that was a bill that I think pretty much sailed through. Everybody wanted to see that, uh, give those, uh, those folks another opportunity to get their health care. That'll be good. because they. Everybody needs it. Well, they do, and they need more options, and uh, this mm -hmm. is just one more option for them. It'll help. It'll help with the farmers, I yeah, think. Yeah, so. I think so. Now, there's some other things that you've got going on. Well, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> more than just one. Yeah. And um, one of those is your summer committees. Summer study committees. Mm -hmm. So, Debbie, the way the summer study committees work is the Speaker of the House and the President Pro Tem of the Senate assign you to a summer study committee or committees in some cases. Um, and um, I chair the Veterans Affairs and Public Safety Committee during this session. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean I would chair the Summer Study Committee of Veterans Affairs and Public Safety, but I have the last few years, and I am again this year. Um, and then I'm also on the Roads and Transportation Summer Study Committee, the Integrated Public Safety Commission, and the Homeland Security Foundation, so I have four. Yeah, that's, that's a lot to have. It is a lot. Now, with all those Summer Study Committees, I don't think everybody understands why there's a summer study committee, mm -hmm. what they do, and why they're in place. Mm -hmm. So 
Can you tell everybody what a summer study committee actually does? Right. We will we'll take subjects that are assigned to us. We're not free to uh, come up with our own subject matter. Uh, there's a, a group of legislators called the Legislative Council, uh, and the Legislative Council determines what topics will be studied in summer study committee. At the end of the summer study committee session, um, let's, there'll be uh, reports will be issued, and those reports will have the findings of the committee for that particular subject. It's pretty common for legislation to grow out of that. Uh, once we've studied it, we learned uh, that there is an issue, and maybe we thought we knew the right solution, and maybe we didn't. And now we have done the testimony, and we've uh, found that we do have a, a viable option or options to work with, and so you'll see legislation grow out of that. The difference is, in summer study committees, the Senate and the House are one committee, and then during the session, they're in separate committees in separate chambers. And so, the committee's larger. We'll have uh, Senate uh, members from um, both sides of the aisle, House members both sides of the aisle, and uh, and we'll be uh, we'll be studying um, the topics that were assigned to us. In this particular case, it's going to be quite unique. Um, I don't believe it's ever happened before, but we will be uh, using folks uh, remotely uh, if they wish, instead of being in the committee room itself. Uh, they'll be live on a, a device, an iPad or a computer, uh, but um, there are folks who are rightly so concerned with COVID-19, and so uh, they will be able to be a part of that committee, and, uh, but do so uh, from, from another location, home, work, wherever they wanted to be. Um, and then the, the topic uh, that we are assigned, my committee is assigned, is to evaluate uh, different state agencies that were assigned to me uh, in their response to COVID-19. Then you can actually put together something mm -hmm. that worked, uh, this is what worked best. That's right, uh, Debbie, and it's not designed to uh, be critical. Right. It's not designed uh, to, to suggest that someone didn't do right or well. There was no playbook for COVID-19. Right. We're doing as best we can, and I know you see it across the river in Kentucky. You see it in Indiana. We're doing the best that we can, but we didn't have a playbook. What we're doing is writing a playbook. Yes. Uh, and so what we want to do uh, is evaluate various state agencies and see how did they do. And so the four agencies that the Veterans Affairs and Public Safety Committee are going to evaluate as the Department of Veterans Affairs, I think you right. got a fellow from around here named Joe DeVito that works there. And, uh, I think and, you'll uh, have plenty of statistics for you. Joe will, and Dennis Weimer is the uh, director, and they'll be working with us. Yes. Um, then we have the Indiana State Police. Uh, the commissioner of the state police is Doug Carter, and Doug will be uh, very helpful there. Um, the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, we'll be working with them and under them as the Indiana State Fire Marshal's Office, so that's a pretty big agency. And then the last one that we'll do, uh, the four that we'll do, is the Indiana National Guard. Mm -hmm. And if you can imagine, I mean, there's going to be a lot of work to analyze an agency the size of the Indiana National Guard, oh, yes. or the Indiana State Police for that matter. So uh, we're going to have our work cut out for us. Um, but our goal is to simply say, did we do well? Didn't we do well? If we did, what did we do well? What should we have done? What Maybe what shouldn't we have done? Uh, what would you change if you could do it again? You know, we all think uh, things like that. Right. Uh, but it's uh, just to learn from how we responded. Uh, so, and I'm also, I mean, I'm also on the Roads and Transportation Summer mm -hmm. Study Committee, and we'll be evaluating NDOT and the Bureau of Motor Vehicles. So, I mean, uh, those are some of the biggest state agencies there is, are in Indiana, and we'll be a part of evaluating them. So it'll be a busy uh, probably September and October. It will be. Mm -hmm. But with those, all those state agencies, mm -hmm. each county has a department. So you're going to get more than just a state agency. You're going to get all the county's input from each department, what they did that worked best. And I think that will really benefit. In a lot of ways they do, Debbie. Um, uh, each county would have, for instance, the NDOT would yeah. have a state highway garage right. or something like that. Uh, each, each agency is very different and their task is different and and so it's going to be interesting to see uh, what, what decisions they made. Did they uh, have people working from home? Um, did they continue to have people working together? NDOT crews, um, they, you know, they ride in the truck together and yes. they work together. So how'd they handle that? It'd be interesting to see. Uh, state police, you know, they uh, they usually are pretty much by themselves or with one other trooper, 
but they also do a, a, you know, a training and so on, how oh, they yes. handle that. So it'll be interesting to see. I'm, uh, I'm excited to uh, wade into it. And um, by the end of October, we'll have to have our uh, report finished and uh, submitted to the Legislative Council. Before all the holidays come. Well, and, and uh, shortly after the election is Organization mm -hmm. Day, and it's the first official day of session. Right. So, so uh, it'll come around much quicker than you think. Oh my goodness. Well, now, is there anything else we need to tell people about what's going on so far? Or we? Well, probably just uh, one to thank everyone for um, their patience uh, with the uh, COVID-19. Yes. It's uh, dangerous. It's very dangerous. We've got uh, hospitals in our state right now that are at capacity. Um, we've done, I think, a, a really good job. I think Governor Holcomb's done a fabulous job in guiding our state. But on the same hand, uh, we still have to continue to be careful ourselves. Uh, we need to continue to social distance as we are here. And, and uh, when you're in public uh, a group, you certainly should wear a mask. Uh, certainly continue to wash your hands. And I think good common sense sometimes go a long way. Right. And, and uh, we, we ought to protect one another, and together we'll get through it. Right. You know, when I was a kid, my grandmother washed all the groceries that came in the house. And I never really understood why she did that until this. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I did do some of that mm -hmm. as I grew up, mm -hmm. but not like I do now. Mm -hmm. So everything that comes in the house gets washed. It it's certainly just, makes you think. It does. It does. So, well, this is wonderful. Thank you'll you, be back again, me. I'm sure. Well, if you'll have us back, we'll be back. Oh, I, we'll have you back. Okay. <laughs> no problem. All right. So, well, thanks again. My pleasure. Thank you. And we greatly appreciate our sponsors for making all of this possible, and we thank you for watching.